Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cyclosure uh, interview with, uh, with Chris. Uh, my name is Theodor, and with me as co-interviewers, I have Tomasz and Daniel. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. Hey. Hi. Hello. So uh, there has been a lot of interesting changes recently in the closure data science community surrounding uh, tech data sets and surrounding libraries, which will enable us to do more meaningful work uh, in data science with closure. Uh, so our goal for this interview is to explore those changes and see if we can build a broader understanding of them. Um, we're not aiming for a general programming audience. We assume some familiarity with, uh, with Clojure and uh, a motivation for data science. Yeah, so hello, Chris. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I am really happy to be here. Thank you guys for organizing this and setting it up. Um, and uh, Tomas and Daniel, uh, do you want to uh, say something as well? Just hello, I'm so happy to meet. Yeah, the same here, hello. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so Chris, uh, we were talking briefly uh, offline uh, about what work you had done previously. Uh, and I was listening to the uh, podcast uh, where Daniel Compton was interviewing you. Uh, that gave me some time perspective on what's happening uh, the last uh, the last time. But can you take us take us back a bit? Uh, why are you interested in high performance computing, and what has brought you to to where you are now? Yeah. So. Um, the, the long stretch of it is that I want to be able to write code that performs as well as any code written in any system. And I want to be able to do it in a high language, specifically in a Lisp, so that I can write that code without generating RSI. <laughs> <laughs> because there's some analogy, uh, there's some parallel between really high performance systems and the amount of code you actually physically have to write. And unfortunately, as you go for higher performance systems, mostly I feel like due to weaknesses in the language and compiler stack, you usually end up writing a lot of code. And a lot of that just little bits of incidental complexity that you're trying to avoid taking a lot of time in a bad situation. Um, I, uh, I really like Lisp a lot. I like Common Lisp a lot. And uh, I feel like Clojure solves actual um, structural problems in Common Lisp that can't ever go away, regardless of what libraries you use in Common Lisp. And the biggest structural problem is the platform it sits on. Um, the JVM is, is just really nice. But I want to be able to write in Clojure, I want to be able to write code on the JVM that performs as well as code in C. And that gives, uh, that's, you know, in a perfect world, that is totally possible. But in the real world, that takes a lot of thought. And sometimes it's not possible. And sometimes it's considerably faster because you've had more time to experiment and structure your algorithms differently. So um, would it be right to say that you actually aim for making a system that's as performant as the fastest systems and as user-friendly as a normal closure system with a REPL? I would say yes, but because I feel that the performance in this environment is very difficult, I aim for at least making sure the baseline performance is physically possible. And then backing off from baseline performance, that's what I want. I try to make it more use, usable over time. And that way I at least know that I'm checking, it's, I'm checking my architecture against a real thing um, every a lot of the steps of the way. Not every step, but a lot of the steps of the way. That's, it makes me glad to hear that's, that's, that's the goal. Uh, <laughs> that sounds good. 
yeah so uh what 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 brought you to this uh what kind of systems have you been working on uh previously because i'm guessing that the kind of experience you need to to achieve this kind of performance isn't something you build by building closure web apps no yeah so my background is in high performance c plus plus and many many years in that and one area i was able to work I was able to lead a team where I was able to experiment a lot with language design, even in C++. And so um, I came to, at the very end of my career, right before I switched to Clojure, I came to a design that I felt like would, was basically had almost every problem that mattered had two parts. And I would design a, a set of big virtual systems that were like singletons in the system. And they would communicate to each other with, uh, arrays of structs. And in this context, a struct has an extremely specific name, uh, meaning, and it basically means that you obey two rules. And the rule is, one rule is you're zero initialized. Um, and the second rule is that your equals operator has um, mem copy semantics. And so that allows me to have kind of really big systems that don't have these really strong hardware level constraints on them, but they communicate in uh, groups or arrays of objects that do have these really strong semantics. And that I felt allowed me to uh, fairly quickly get good performance on a range of different problems, um, just as an initial shot. And sometimes the problem doesn't fit that. I'm not saying every problem does, but that, that kind of had a lot of influence on the way I think. And when we first started trying to do uh, Cortex enclosure. Uh, one of the guys working with us had a so, lot so of for context. Can you uh, introduce uh, yes. Cortex with a few sentences? Yeah. So Cortex was just a deep learning engine, a neural network engine enclosure that had GPU bindings. Um, it it still is the the project I've worked on that has the most stars. Even though it's it it, it I think for a while it was decent in terms of a deep learning engine if you were to compare it against anything else. And if you were comparing against anything that existed in Clojure, it was amazing. But, um, but deep learning is a highly competitive field. And without a well-funded team of good engineers, you cannot produce a deep learning engine that is competitive uh, with a lot of the big ones, even in a high level language. Like you, you, it's just the amount of research required on every little component is just tremendous. Uh, but, um, but through writing that, one of the guys who was a Python expert um, his name's Ben Camphouse. He just basically said, like, you're rebuilding various parts of NumPy and Pandas. And he was also talking about when he worked in his education, his previous job, he was working with a lot of, like, satellite imagery systems. And they had a lot of code written in this crazy language called APL. And there's some long history of knowledge that comes from APL that I think dovetails well with both Lisp and with the, t the ways that I learned to structure programs when I was doing high performance computing at NVIDIA. Um, and I realized this, but didn't have the time to pursue it at Think Topic. And I've just been pursuing it slowly, trying to take measurable steps uh, on my own time for quite a while now. Mm. Yeah, so uh, uh, I really want to go into the uh, APL and, and Lisp uh, distinction later. That was something that really interested me based on the documentation that you've written uh, mm -hmm. for TechML. Uh, but first, uh, if we can detour a bit, uh, can you give us some impression of what you were doing at NVIDIA? Uh, what yeah. was your, what, yeah, what was the goal of, of your work there? Yeah, so, um... I worked on a, quite a few things at NVIDIA. Um, the, there's two major projects that I had a lot of influence on and with, I worked with quite a bit. One project was the NVIDIA PhysX debugger. So PhysX is a physics library that NVIDIA produces that has, of course, excellent GPU bindings and some of the most advanced real-time physics you can ever hope to do. And um, they, for an advanced physics engine, 
<laughs> you need to know like, why did this guy walk through that wall? <laughs> like, why, what happened here? Why did the physics, why, did, why is everything bouncing around the whole level really fast? You have to be able to debug these scenarios is that engine sometimes runs off the rails. And so we, they built a debugger and I ended up building, rebuilding it, and maintaining it. And it, what it did is it, it had a replayable object graph recording of the whole physics simulation. So we would, uh, I would, you'd open up a, a network socket to the debugger from the physics engine and the physics engine and your game engine would send little updates of every single object in the engine. And this adds up to quite a lot of information over a, a decent sized game like uh, Batman's Arkham Asylum, where it's a, it's a triple A title and there's literally thousands of things all the time bouncing into each other. Um, that was happening without immutability and without persistent data structures, right? Yes, kind of. Hmm. I actually got a really bad case of RSI before I ever, on the, the project that got uh, me hired at NVIDIA, I got a really bad case of RSI on, working with a lot of other people. And at the very end, this was all in, this was in C Sharp, back in the day when you would, uh, you had a bunch of, C Sharp had come out and the new UI platform had come out for C Sharp. Uh, I think it was Forms first and then it came, became something else, but it, uh, I, I got RSI working on it. And somehow in there, I figured out that uh, I was fixing too many problems due to immutable issues. Similar to Rich's conclusion, but I think on a different type of problem. And I started working with Link a lot more in C Sharp. And I started making everything enumerable, which is the, the C Sharp version of a sequence. And I mean, I really, really, really put a lot of effort into thinking about how programming mainly immutably would simplify even high performance systems. Um, and then I remember, for instance, I, I really got on that bandwagon quite far. And I remember out of nowhere, and you, I mean, you, every organization has this, but like, I remember out of no, nowhere, writing the CUDA compiler team, uh, telling them I feel like they were on the wrong road because they were writing their, their runtime for CUDA was so structured on mutability and being able to put data in certain places very precisely. And I remember, you know, they said, I mean, one, the, the general response to the team was, um, thanks kid, we got it, <laughs> which is fine. And uh, another response was, we don't think there's, there's advanced enough compiler technology to implement the things that you're saying. And then one guy who is actually pretty high up said, yeah, the future is immutable and functional for sure, but we don't know how to get there from here. Um, and so that also had a pretty profound effect on how I thought. Um, and so I've kind of been interested in this, this overlap of, of functional programming, but also the highest performance you can possibly get on a machine. So given a problem where you've, you've spent, you know, a lot of time making it really fast, can I destructure it a little bit and make it functional in various ways? Or how far can I destructure it the functional pathway and still keep the performance constraints? Um, usually that requires some level of, of uh, agreement that, you know, this data, this section of the problem just can't be functional. We can't do it. I just don't know an algorithm that I can do it, but 90% of the problem can be functional. That's, that's um, really interesting to hear. Uh, I, I was curious about uh, the motivation behind immutability, and I've heard the argument uh, a lot of times that it simplifies reasoning because it's easier to reason about immutability than, than mutability. Yep. But is there a performance-related argument to be made here? There's two of them. Uh, one is hard to realize, and one I think is easier to understand that I know of. I'm sure there's more, but um, when you describe your program, and the Haskell guys talk about this a lot, if when you describe your program in a purely functional way, then you're, the dependency graph of your computations is part of your program because you can't change something previous. So you, 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 you know by just analyzing the type flow of the program, the dependency graph of what depends on what. 
eventually when you were talking about, and we'll come back to this, this actually applies to this conversation very directly. Eventually knowing your dependency graph allows the system and knowing what, for instance, is a commutative operation allows your system to auto parallelize vast portions of it or allows you to parallelize portions of it without having to think about various things. So that's a theoretical argument. The concrete argument is if I'm a C++ compiler and you're passing me a bunch of things that aren't const in a pointer, every time I access that pointer, I have to load it from memory because I just don't know what has changed it outside of my purview. I don't even, if you pass me two pointers in a function, I don't even know that one pointer doesn't reference, isn't aliasing another pointer. So I might, even if you have like two pointers to a function, you load them both into local variables, to you, that might be a local variable, but every time you write to one, I might have to reload the other under the covers. And so you can imagine how once I can make things pass structs into the function, instead of passing variables by pointer, uh, where the compiler is just copying the whole struct verbatim into the function, now the compiler can make the same reasoning that we're trying to make at a higher level. Mm. And, that, and, when you, and when you say pass structs into the function, you essentially pass a value in there. Yes. Uh, not something that can be immutable. So in closure terms, yep. you're passing a value and not the reference type like an atom or something similar. Exactly, exactly. Um, and that, that trips a lot of C++ people up because old school C++, all the instruction manuals told you to use references all over the place, which is a pointer. And then you found out that you were causing all these horrible assembly level errors that were causing the processors to have to reload data all the time because you were passing pointers around the whole program. And you never knew which section of the program would affect another section of the program. <laughs> Um, and neither did the compiler. Hmm. So, so there's definitely space to expand on that kind of pathway and use functional programming in high performance systems. It's just, it's just a different, I don't know, it's different. Hmm. Is it possible if we look at the argument on the other side, can you uh, uh, say a little bit about when mutability is needed? Because I imagine that sometimes in really low level code, you yeah. might need it. Yeah, I mean, it can be needed when you have rapid changes to a small percentage of your data set and you do need actual to broadcast those changes between a lot of different entities at once. So you're dealing with shared memory on disk and you're actually trying to organize a couple programs around it or you're, you just have one program where you do have some reason that you need some core of the program to be visible to the whole program all the time. So a shared state of a board or something like that. Although, I mean, I know Rich's like original example was the shared ants kind of wandering around and that was a beautiful example. But as you try to scale that up, you end up with so many, um, uh, you end up with so many conflicts of people trying to write that you actually can get a lot more performance by just being more disciplined about blocking certain things. Um, all in all, though, I, I, in my experience, it's pretty rare. It's more rare that you need mutability to solve the problem than it is that if I just have a real fast copy that I can just copy half the data set into a thread safe area and then do whatever I want and then copy it back in block. Um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting uh, to, to hear about. And I love being able to touch on a bit of immutability as well. Yeah. Uh, so what, what brought you towards closure from, from there? Uh, I got into common lisp and then, uh, similar to Rich, I got into common lisp and then closure came out and, you know, I watched Rich's simple made easy and that really meant a lot to me, although you may not see it cause I tend to write big complex libraries. Well, that was close. Uh, but I, it did actually mean a whole lot to me. And uh, I wasn't a fan of the JVM. I would have much rather it been .NET. I think the .NET runtime is amazing. But now that I know the JVM better, the legacy of the JVM and the amount of code and the amount of testing that's gone into it, it just, it's just a powerhouse. Um, and we still have, I mean, we still have, I think most, if you were like to take, a poll of most programmers, 
I th literally everybody who programs something that isn't JavaScript, that isn't a browser, I think the most people in the world program Java eight or seven. <laughs> if you were to find one common thread among all of them, because you have essentially these huge software firms in India employing millions and millions of people who are on Java seven or Java eight. And the US government's pretty much on Java eight from what I hear. And so you have this huge install base of a system where you could actually use it like what, I mean, this was a lot of Rich's thinking. And, and the, the, the disappointing thing about Lisp is that it, it uh, the AI winner, what made it fail wasn't so much the AI winner in a lot of ways, it was the difficulty of porting the high performance bits of it to different architectures. Can I, can I ask you to take a small detour? Uh, Lisp now mean, does that mean common Lisp? And, yes. Uh, would you like to s say a little bit about the AI winter for understanding? Yeah. So, you know, back in the, I guess, 70s, people got into Lisp, 70s and 80s, people got into Lisp quite a ways, common Lisp. I mean, the before common Lisp at that point. And it fractured off into a bunch of, at that time, were AI companies. Um, but they were really doing expert systems because we didn't know enough of modern machine learning to make it work. Uh, but expert systems are essentially big rules-based kind of clever prologue-y kind of things. And um, those, some of those are still around, but a lot, a lot, a lot of those companies failed as various server architectures that they had tightly bound their Lisp implementation to went out of vogue. And they actually had such hardcore implementations of various different details, they could not port those big list systems to x86. Um, and so there's, there's a huge amount of loss there and loss of knowledge there due to the failure, due to how tightly bound those Lisp implementations were to the underlying hardware. I mean, they had Lisp machines that they had bound it to at the assembly level to do things. And I'm sure that worked great but then when everybody in the world didn't want a risk list machine, you lost your market base really quick. And it, there's all sorts of mistakes. I mean, most of those companies, oh man, this could get me in trouble. Most, Cause I have an engineering run company. If most of those companies were engineering run, so they were more interested in research and exploring what's possible than they were on market capitalization. And so when downturns hit and there were two, relatively, I mean, there's one in like 75 and there's another one in 83. They weren't in a position to survive the hard periods. Um, in addition to the fact they had a hard time porting their stuff. And this is just ad hoc what I've learned. There are good documents on the history of Lisp and what happened to all those companies because there were really a lot of them. They were really well funded for a while. I mean, hmm. but the, the thing is, is being able to program the compiler seems like the ace card. <laughs> Like a homo iconic language where you can program the compiler, man, that just feels like you could do anything. Like there should be no limits to that. Um, but there, there are some <laughs> still. So to, to try to summarize a bit, uh, you got into uh, Common Lisp after NVIDIA. Uh, and Common Lisp is this huge uh, old tradition and ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, that currently does not have a huge uh, platform support. Would you well, agree the, with the that? The common that survive probably do run on everything, but the X, it's just a rough, it's a rough system. To use common list now, a lot of the things that you take for granted, like, oh, there's a, at least in Java, you have a collections interface at all. And it's not just like, the Lisp is completely, the, the list data structure is completely unrelated from the vector data structure, which is completely unrelated from the map data structure. And, oh yeah, if you wanted a sorted map, you have to pull in this library over here and it doesn't share any commonality with the other four. And it's all these like little pieces that don't share any interface. So you have to learn each little piece. It just feels really archaic to use now, in my opinion. Hmm. Oh. So, so you were you were getting interested in, in Lisp, and you you were uh, getting interested in using Lisp or Clojure rather than doing C Yeah, I when I when I finished with Nvidia, um, I had a buddy who invited me to 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 be part of the founding process of a company, 
And he was also a big believer in closure. And we just kind of went for it. And uh, for better or for worse, I've always felt like the answer is higher level programming, but it's just, it's hard to convince the C++ guys of that or the Rust guys. Although Rust is a lot higher level than C++, so that they're gonna be even harder to convince, but it's hard to convince people to try high level stuff when they try it a few times and the performance is a thousand times worse than <laughs> they tried on a couple of their toy problems, they get a hundred times worse performance. And it's like, well, yes, your problem was a toy, but you got to learn a lot to get the performance you're looking for. But they're looking through the lens of like, can I do the thing as fast? And that's not really the goal of a high level language all the time. So uh, did you found this company uh, close to Closure's conception or was Closure uh, more? No. So I first started doing Clojure in 2008 and I have on my, the oldest repository I still have access to on my personal GitHub is a little graphics editor where I could run a little 3D scene and I could edit the shaders. And it was written front to back in Clojure and uses all sorts of horky things because I was like still in the mode of C++. So like it's got some weird architectural concepts in there but it did work. Um, and that was in 2008. Yeah, and Closure 1.0 was released in 2007, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah, so it's like 1.2 and there was no line engine and I don't remember <laughs> how I got to work and you had to do all these really weird command line arguments to get Swing to allow you to get to OpenGL and it was just, it was kind of nuts, but it worked. And I remember showing it to my friends at NVIDIA being like, look, I wrote a program and not only can I edit the shader, but watch this, I can edit the source code of the program and the whole program will behave different now. And I thought that was really neat, and they were somewhat nonplussed by it. <laughs> huh. Wow. So um, you you started using Clojure for high-performance stuff, and we will eventually end up at the tech stack. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess this was related to some of your work at the company. And, and is this company tech isn't, or No, the first one was Think Topic. And we were specifically working on trying to mix Clojure and machine learning really early. I mean, before there was, uh, there was no, um, what the hell is the Google AI platform? There's no TensorFlow. There's really almost no Keras. Maybe Keras started a year or two after we were in or right when we started, but like you couldn't get things working in Keras really. Um, there was, uh, I think it was called Cafe. There's a big C++ toolkit, Cafe maybe. I can't remember, but it was really hard to use. Um, and it's since fallen out of favor. And so eventually we just decided to go further down the route into neural networks. And actually, I wish we'd have chose to go just down the route of basic machine learning first and then neural networks second, because you can actually get really far with basic machine learning, just a, a, like you... XGBoost. Can you, can you make the difference between those two clear? Uh, yeah, that's not so, entirely, yeah. So deep learning is like, hmm, all of machine, I mean, pretty much all machine learning is some, some level of statistical inference. I mean, you have some amount of data that you're updating a model with, and then when you're done updating the model, you run it through other data and see how well it predicts the output. And it's just a matter of how powerful that model is. So. You know, a lot of these models you can think of as single level black boxes that they do a dot, a single dot product or something like that. And that's their, the result of the dot product is their prediction. And in a neural net, you just have like many of these black boxes chained together before you get to the final output is a very general way of kind of putting it. And each black box can transform that problem into a higher and higher dimensionality space. And so as I add more linear layers to a network, I can start mapping it to nonlinear, more and more nonlinear and more higher dimensional problems. Whereas, you know, a tree-based method like XGBoost is essentially just a big tree of if statements. And it has some interesting capabilities, but it can't map to a really high dimensional space well, like facial rec. Or uh, the linear models all boil down to a dot product. So they can only do a linear mapping at the end of the day. And you have to have enough features going into them that the output can map the, the, the dot product of the, your dot product against your feature set can actually produce your mapping that you need. And so with the, like, a, and those would, those would be like elastic net or they'd be like basic linear regression, multivariate, like not even multivariate, just basic linear regression. Um, 
there's kind of a, a whole range in there, but the neural nets, the theory was you would never have to do feature engineering because the neural net, you could just add more layers and it would learn the features it needed. And my experience in practice has been that has not been the case all the time. <laughs> Can I ask you to define it's, it's feature really engineering as well? Oh, uh, Tomas, do you want to say something? Yeah, it's really hard to force you know, neural net to sh and shape neural net to yeah. behave as, as you wish. Yeah. Yep. It's easier with st statistical modeling. Yeah. Um, and then, okay, Theodore? Yeah, uh, so can you define uh, what feature engineering is as well? Yeah, so this is actually getting into the core of almost, I think the most interesting parts of machine learning is you can, you can get a good answer in two different ways of uh, if you wanna take a black box and produce uh, an answer. And I could have a more powerful black box or I could manipulate my problem such that it matches the black box closer. Feature engineering is transforming the problem before you give it to the, the black box. And the beauty of that is then you can run a, a wider range of black boxes against it. And on average, all of their results will be better. As opposed to having one super powerful black box that may or may not work. Um, and that has so many, what are called hyperparameters, has so many parameters that feed it that you might spoil the oceans trying to find the perfect set. Hmm. Um, a good example is if you just have, if you wanna, if you wanna map a line to an equation and your equation is X squared, then your best bet of mapping a line to that is taking the square root, map the line to that, and then square the result. <laughs> yeah because your predictor is only a linear predictor, it can only map a line. So you have to transform whatever you're trying to guess into a line before you try to map it. And that's like the most basic sense of feature engineering I can think of. Would it be right to say that you're kind of, uh, when you're doing feature engineering, uh, you're trying to use your knowledge to set constraints so that the only solutions you're getting are valid solutions and yes. that will improve the result? Yep you're trying to do that and you're trying to use, you are definitely using your knowledge to, to make the result better. And so it's dependent on the machine learner a lot as you get further and further. In, and I, I think it's also a matter of, yeah, you, you find out little edges of the data set and you make inferences about how the variables must relate based off your mental model of reality <laughs> mm -hmm. and kind of push that into the machine learning engine, which can't know what you know about reality. So. Interesting. Yeah, uh, I guess we should uh, move towards your <laughs> your libraries too. Uh, so this was before uh, your, your this was uh, during your first first company, mm -hmm. and uh, what what year approximately? We were in two thousand and eight, two thousand and eight to. Um, I'm gonna find out specifically because I I GitHub. I think it was earlier than 2008. Um, let's see. And we'd worked on this a long time before the first commit, but like the last commit was 2017. So that was, I, and I'd worked on it a, a couple years before that. So this was like started in 2006, I think. And we're we'd done about Cortex now. Say what? We're talking about Cortex. Yeah, yeah. So. I don't exactly remember the beginning, but it's like 2015, 2016 when I left NVIDIA. So we must've started right around then. Hmm. Um, and the ecosystem was still pretty, I mean, it's still pretty rough, like, and not just Clojure, Docker was really rough then. And I'm a huge believer in Docker, but man, we really, we, we got burned on Docker quite a bit in the early days. For a good example of getting really burned badly is Docker machine which isn't, I don't think, produced by the core Docker team, but Docker Machine uh, used to shut down our servers when a different person would try to use it. So you being the person who, who launched the Docker container, it would work fine. But when somebody else tried to, to SSH into that Docker container, Docker Machine would just shut down the container. Like that was their solution to something. I don't remember what it was, but that's obviously your clients are not really happy with that. <laughs> oh. yeah. 
So that was a handful to try to write on that in the early days. So moving towards the tech stack, uh, what was the first tech library? Hmm. Well, when Theme Topic ended, I wanted to continue my research into kind of binding these numeric worlds to Clojure. And I, some of it was just working on libraries that I knew were interesting to Think Topic, but are not meaningful to discussion. They're just utility stuff. And then I think um, I pulled out the actual math portion of Cortex, which was sort of a, I'm gonna, it was sort of a very, I would say a poorly done Neanderthal as Neanderthal is done right now. So it was like a low level math library. You could add two vectors, you could do GEM, you could do all the things you needed for Cortex, which sounds like a lot, but it's really not in terms of math. And uh, it would work on CPU and GPU. Um, and so in that sense, it was, it was a little bit, it was always targeted towards really high performance, which made it really difficult to use in a lot of ways and not useful for generalized closure programming. And that became data type after a lot of thinking. Mm. <laughs> and data type as we understand it now is the foundation for very much on which we build. Yeah. Data type is the foundation for the data set library. And the data set library, I think, is the, the library that could be potentially useful to a lot of closure programmers. OK. So uh, if we want to make this really, really clear, uh, how would you define the data type library and the data set library? And who are the appropriate users of each? So the data type library is a graduated progression from general closure sequence oriented programming down the path towards numeric programming of the type represented by languages like APL and to a lesser extent NumPy. And that form of programming has a lot of advantages and in terms of performance and often in terms of readability if you're doing fundamentally numeric algorithms. Hmm. Um, and so data type is me trying to add this layer. It's almost like, uh, it's almost more like it's typed at the lowest level and it, it's expecting typed containers. So I have a long, I have a typed container of doubles and each container has a count. So if you take closure, like the core of closure, I feel like is a sequence. It's a sequence is a thing where I, I can get the first item of the sequence and there may be something after it. And that's all I know. There's very little information about my problem. Um, the base data structure in data type is a reader. Um, to differentiate that from a sequence, a reader has, is countable in constant time. So it's got a count that doesn't require me to go through it and it's randomly addressable. So that is the most basic change from closure to data type. That's the first small change. So a reader is what is something like an array, right? Yes. But more abstract, I guess, right? Yep. It's an abstraction of an array because I didn't want to have an interface that could both read and write. Hmm. And I also wanted a, I wanted a transformation step between a generic object and a reader. And so an array you can always read from, but in the data type world, it, before you read from something, you often have to, to ask for the reader of that object because things can have a non-trivial translation to the reader that might actually be time consuming. But once I get the reader, I expect to be able to read and write to it quite quickly or, or read from it. Would now be a good idea to uh, look at this in a REPL? Yeah, um, let's at least get it. We can continue the interview and I'll, I'll have a REPL up and we can walk through it. A REPL that's not, you guys have to tell me like what, um, what, uh, what level of, oh, Zoom. The Zoom, hmm. share, oh, here it is. Yeah. That's I just want to share that. Great. We can see your uh, terminal. You can see it? Yep. Is it? 
about the right resolution? Yes. Okay. Um, so readers are types. So there's a reader for every primitive type in Java. Um, but I don't actually think for, th for the purposes of discussion, if you just remember they're typed, I think that's plenty. Oh man. There's so many helper and defaults in here that it's hard to actually get to the point. Um, a reader really consists of two functions. And one of those functions is in a base class, a base interface, so you can't see it. But the main function is read. You basically have two. You have like, what's the size of this thing and the read function. So if I'm in code, which might be a better way to actually do this, um, If I'm in code, then I only need to, to reify two things to create a new reader. But already, well, there's three, in, there's three concepts in a reader, data type, count, and how to get the next thing. And that makes it three times as complex as a sequence. <laughs> uh, so, um, let's just deal with objects for now. Readers have a type, but to make a new reader, uh, if I reify a reader, I have one function which is L size. So specifically the size function returns longs. Absolutely it returns longs because I wanna use these things on things that are a lot bigger than four gigabytes, potentially really big things. So your size has to return along. But anyway, in this case, we'll say our size is five and uh, we'll just return the index. And that's gonna make it look like a persistent vector to closure. And readers implement all of the interfaces you need to be a Java list and the typed interfaces from a library called FastUtil to be a fast, to be a typed list. And they, you only have to implement two functions. So uh, just to, to ask the stupid questions. So now you essentially at runtime created something like a dynamic generator or, or yes, something? Exactly. Because you, you, wrote, you wrote the read function to just return the index. Yep. And when you're writing it, it's only when you're pressing enter after the last parenthesis on line 47 that this is actually loaded into something. Before that, it's just some abstract thing. Yep, yep. And, and I mean, I mean, you could create something that's like so big we can't see it in the REPL. Um, yeah. And it's instant because that's all just generated data. Hmm. Um, but you couldn't create a persistent vector that was that big, I don't think. But if we try to uh, print out RDR now, then things will crash. Yep. Hmm. But, yeah. but that might be a problem we don't have when we use the data type. No, right. sorry, uh, data sets. Correct. Yeah, because data set and the, the tensor library and the data set library always kind of make things, the tensor extension to data type, which I don't actually think is that useful. Maybe I won't mention that again for now. But the, the, I, I've been careful so that when you print things to the REPL, they are only taking fixed size of things. At most 20 or something like that. <laughs> hmm. um, and so, so that- I, my, my question is, uh, imagine because you generate here the, the content, what about the content uh, you put in from the sequence? Pure closure sequence from from the file or whatever. So, uh, do you just wrap around the persistent vector or something like that, or you put to the to an array? Well, so if I need it to be countable, I make sure it's countable, but I stop after that. Mm -hmm. So, for persistent vectors, they're they're countable, so they have a translation to reader um, that does nothing. Okay. Um, or it does very little. I mean, essentially a, a persistent vector implements java.util.list. So that makes it a readable object and I might change it or I might just use it as a list. It just depends. Um, 
But for a sequence, that means I have to wrap it in something. So an object, I have to convert it to an object array or something like that. Something countable in constant time. Okay. In random access, actually. Both of those are important. But as we move from a sequence-based programming where all I know is I have one thing and I could get the next, this is a very minimal definition of computing. I think it's actually axiomatic, um, minimal, to, to a reader definition. Readers are meant to model random access memory. So I've moved from a definition of computing that is based off pure sort of S expression uh, sort of type computing to uh, more like a von Neumann type machine where there are, I mean, your computer, your memory, this is an interesting thing to think about. The RAM on your computer is untyped and your operations are typed. <laughs> <laughs> but RAM has a fixed size. So um, that's just kind of an interesting thing. Your assembly instructions are all typed, but your RAM is untyped. And that's the basis of computing that we use in a hardware level. Um, I, I don't know. I just always found that kind of an interesting thing. But remember earlier I was talking about how to make things fast, you often have to know the dependency chain. Of, of what produced them so I can calculate, basically so I can group dependencies together in little tight loops. And um, when I create a sequence, every member of the sequence is dependent on the one before it. When I create a reader, the reader's dependency chain is flat. Everything in the reader is just dependent on the reader and not really anything else. So I've, so vastly, like I've broadened my space of potential optimizations. I'll just apologize for a moment. I was asked to go somewhere, so I need to leave. Okay. And I will come back in a moment. So mm -hmm. see you, I hope. We'll see All you right. Now. So Chris, if I may ask, uh, can we look at a sequence and compare it to the reader? Mm -hmm. So do you mean an actual, like a real sequence? I'm trying to think. Um, uh, like, I, I'm I'm uh, interested in, in exploring what you were saying. So uh, you uh, you reified the object reader. So just in in that context, uh, is there a similar concept in tech uh, data type? Um, for sequences, the closest thing in tech data type is iterable. Okay, okay. So your your point is uh, a foundational one. Uh, that we need readers and not sequences if we're going to make things fast because then elements aren't depending on the previous elements. Right. Yeah, that's one, that's, that is one point. The first step into like numeric programming is having random access memory. Huh, interesting. Is having a countable thing that I can randomly address. I think that is the most small graduated step. Mm -hmm. But but the, the thing is, is when, when, not to rip on Java, but when Java people think of that, they think of an array list that is realized in a concrete sense. And what I'm trying to do is, is draw an analogy between a sequence, which is a, a virtual realization of a bunch of data and a reader, which is also a virtual realization of a bunch of data, but the reader is random access. Mm. Because just like the example you showed, you never generated the list from zero to four. You right. just and return the element that's, yeah. So another interesting part of that, uh, so because of that, I can do something like, um, I can, uh, oh, and I also do a lot of, lot of compile time optimization. So the first time you require a data type, if you don't AOT, there's a hit there. Um, and so that's, that's one thing that does pop up now and now, but that's kind of a side point. So uh, if I des if I have a new reader, that's some mathematical abstraction on the first reader. Um, if I do, I can do And that happened instantly. <laughs> Uh, and that all did work. Um, 
And so I can do these sort of mathematical operations by creating a new reader on top of the old reader. So under the covers, what that did is, uh, uh, let's see if I do this, it, if I do this by hand, it's gonna be something like um, custom two is reify object reader, L size of AR is dot L size. Oh, whoops, of new, uh, I run out of names after a very short amount of time. Um, so that did the exact same thing, just with a little bit more, you actually see the machinery there. Whoops. Mm -hmm. Take five. Um, and I can do more sort of manipulations like that. Like I, in constant time, I could reverse the original reader. Um, I could index into a subsection of it and get back uh, a new reader that with a set of indexes that would allow it to do some indirection. There's just a lot I can do of this like lazy definition of an array. Hmm. Okay, so so the uh, the question I asked the before uh, someday, uh, how to write my own functions which work with the data type and data sets, yeah, which operate mm -hmm. on columns. So essentially I have to just uh, kind of write a reader. Yeah. If I, if I want to something specific, which is not included in the library. Okay. Yeah, that'll be the highest, that would be my guess is what would perform the best or, and or use the least amount of memory. Mm -hmm. As we move to bigger and bigger data sets, honestly, I feel like performance becomes less of an issue and the amount of RAM you use becomes more. Um, because, um, you know, if you run out of RAM and you start getting, oh, out of memory exceptions, you're done. Like your whole computation process has stopped. And if you, as long as your algorithms are decent, if you have a really big data set and it just takes another 10 minutes, that's less of a problem than not being able to fit the data set in memory. Mm -hmm. so, so at some level, being able to algorithmically generate columns and or more information without concretely generating it leads to some level of a memory advantage. Um, I'm not sure how easy it is to realize that in practice. I'm going to make the boring comment now, and I'm I'm looking at the time, and we've already uh, been doing this for 50 minutes. Uh, so, would we perhaps like to uh, connect this to the datasets library and look at uh, how we would use that in comparison? Yeah. So let's uh, let's bring some of these concepts together. I actually think this is good though because we're 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 carefully walking up the set of abstractions. Yeah, it feels really good for me as well. Um, Just a question, when you're running this from source, because now you're uh, opening the projects in, in Emacs, you're not using the pre-compiled jar that, that, that we'll, we'll be using. Uh, are you are noticing you different performance than we will be? You know, one thing, I haven't. Um, I'm not sure why that is, to tell you the truth. But uh, the I think one, I think it's just easier for Hotspot to optimize a lot of this stuff. And so even at the lower levels of optimization in the REPL, you get a decent amount of optimization because um, the problem just fits the machine a lot better. Hmm. Um, so my favorite example is this stocks data set and I don't know why. Um, Uh, but it has kind of a lot of the nice whoops. So I'm just going to ask uh, the so dataset slash two datasets is that kind of a generic importer function that makes uh, some things datasets? Yeah, and it's it's okay. It works for for files. It works for input streams, including if the file could be XLSX. I don't know that I have a stock. I don't know the name of one offhand, 
but it also probably most importantly for a lot of people, um, it, works maps. Yeah. it works with maps. Um, and I think that is the bridge right there between closure and uh, numeric programming. At least that's another small graduated step. Um, so there's, there's our little data set that we built with maps. And I can transform that data set or the stocks data set back to maps um, by creating a MapSeq reader out of it. And since you know what a reader is now, um, maps, DS, uh, you kind of maybe know under the covers that I reified an object reader somewhere and it has a count, which is the number of rows. And when you index into that reader, it dynamically generates a map implementation based off that row data. So you're saying that I can do a map seek reader uh, in constant time, and then I can get the first five elements in then basically constant time as well? Correct, or rand inth, which is crazy. Um, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> wow. That was constant time. Right. And it, and okay, so there's actually a whole lot going on here that maybe, maybe we shouldn't or shouldn't talk about. But for instance, the stocks data set has a symbol and there's not many different symbols in the whole, I think there's five of them. And what the data set library does underneath the covers is it creates a string table and then stores that column in a byte array. So what, does that mean? what it means is that there's five strings in the symbol column and the actual column data is an index in a byte is, 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 is a set of numbers in a byte array, depending on the order the strings came into the system. So there's a string table, which is a map of string to integer and back. So two maps, one to string to integer, one to integer and back. And there's a byte array with indexes, which tells you which string is supposed to be in that index. So you, 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 don't use to, you don't use to create just 500 strings, right? No. You have five objects, right? Yep. And if I want to do, potentially, if we want to do like a unique or hash table or lots of different things, we can just hash table the string table. We can, we can create hash codes for the string table and we know which hash code has to apply to which index implicitly. Um, so I can, I can basically, if I know the set of unique items in a column, I can do things. The other interesting thing is it did this date column, which you see in the MapSeq reader is a local java.time.local date. It's actually stored in the data set as an integer. Um, I, don't know how, I don't know a good way to show that, but like basically I have these, what are called packed types for all the date types. So I'm not storing objects in a data set when I don't need to. Um, and a date, a local date, which is specifically stored as a 32 bit integer, which is quite a lot smaller than an actual local date object in memory. Um, but when I create the MapSeq reader, I'm unwrapping that integer back into a full local date. So you and your user code don't need to worry about that translation. So if I want to work with this, I can essentially uh, dump my source data, which can be quite large, into one place and have it efficiently stored, and then derive the other columns that I need. Yep, exactly. And I think I, I'm in a basic first step for a lot of people, and probably the only step they ever really need, honestly, is load the data set once, do like a little bit of data set processing on it, and then convert it to a MapSeq reader and finish up. I think for a lot of people, your initial step with the TechML data set library might be map sequences of maps to data sets and back. Um, because I think that's a natural way for closure people to think of, of a lot of this stuff. So is this, uh, I just took notes uh, uh, earlier on, you were saying that you felt that you had crossed a threshold with the data sets. Is this the threshold? That's a good question. I don't, I don't concretely know. I just, I know that, I know that in the last two weeks before, I mean, honestly, before daytime support, 
the data set library was interesting but hard to work with because a lot of the things we work with are log streams or things that are very date oriented. <laughs> so you had to convert all that information into like seconds since epochs or something like that. But now that it has dates and it's efficient, it's kind of now we can use it every day for a lot of our problems. So, uh, and plus I feel like now there's community support for it, whereas before it had too many sharp edges and the people who, as Tomas said earlier, when he tried it, it just didn't work. So, and that's because there are just too many sharp edges in it. Um, but each one of these columns can be converted to a reader. I mean, it's, 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 it, is a, it is a continuous form of abstractions all the way down. So if I, when I add something to the price column, if I want to do uh, um, stocks, uh, price, and this will pass in a column. So I can do like partial uh, DFN. Oh, I don't know that I have that because I switched tech. So now you're demoing one of the operations that would be reasonable. You're doing a column-wise operation and showing how that can be neat and efficient. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's uh, it's the same thing I did earlier, updated. Um, maybe we wish that our Microsoft stock was worth more than it is. Um, stocks, price, um, partial. I think this will work. So I'm now, saying I want, I want price. Hmm? So just the function you're sending in there is now taking the whole column. Yeah. So it's the second argument right. to, to plus will be the price column. And so now, oh, and it did it in integer space. That's a bug. That should have worked in floating point space. Um, oh, because the first, yeah. Yeah, that's a bug. So not all the rough edges are out, but in any case, that happened in constant time. It didn't actually do math on the whole column. It just created an equation and set the column to that equation. So we just created the reader. Uh-huh. Wow. That was great. Um, yeah, so I keep looking at the clock now and I see that yeah. we're actually at one hour exactly. Uh, and I, I, I really want to, to go on because this is really exciting. Uh, but I'm thinking that perhaps we should stick to it and then do another interview to continue off where this one. Starts. I think so too. I think it's better to, to really focus on small graduated steps for now. Okay. Uh, in, in that case, I would just like to say a huge thanks, Chris, for taking the time to do this. It was really great to to learn learn the whole thinking behind mm -hmm. behind what you've been doing and that has been helping me a lot because i have had cases where i wanted to use the data frame uh, library but, but i haven't had the conceptual understanding of where it fits and understanding the readers and your thoughts on how to keep this efficient has really helped with that well the i think one key thing to understand is that the data the, the data set library is really, honestly, very loosely bound. If you create a reader, it'll create a column. And it doesn't really know what's missing and not missing or anything like that. It's not going to do a big O of N scan of the column. It's like really loosely bound to the concept of readers. And I think that gives you a lot of flexibility to both solve interesting problems in efficient ways. And uh, I think it gives you a bit of rope that you need to respect because it'll trip you. Mm. <clears throat> yeah okay so uh before we uh, we cut uh is there anything you would like to say to our our readers um i think what i'd like to say is i uh i don't want to oversell anything it's a young library you know numpy took 15 years before people even tried pandas and then pandas took another eight years on top of that before they supported dates or something I mean, it's all very young stuff. So be patient with it, you know, and file issues. I am not, I do not take issues personally. People who, Tomas can tell you, you can file 30 issues in a day and most likely I will really appreciate every one of them. 
I can confirm. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris is fast currently, yeah. of course, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, with that, uh, thanks a lot for a uh, first uh, for the interview and to our um, viewers and, and listeners. I hope this has been uh, a helpful uh, part of understanding the tech ecosystem.